On that day in that ambulance when all my vital life signs fail, the paramedic judged me to be dead. He picked up the radio microphone, he called the hospital ahead, he reported the patient has died. All the vital life signs have failed. Prepare the emergency room in an attempt to revive him, have a physician meet us on the ramp. But while those wonderful and marvelous medical people worked so diligently on this physical body, I wasn't even in it and they didn't know it. Back there in that ambulance, every, every breath that came to me came on as a result of all the strength of my willpower. I fought as hard as I could to breathe in and then just as hard to breathe out. Nothing was free, nothing was easy. When I'd left the little hospital, they did not know where the internal blowout was. And because they did not know where the internal blowout was, they would give me no painkillers. I had no painkillers in me. But I reached a state that I could not endure that pain. No human could. It was as though I was screaming to God with all my might for relief from that pain when the lights went out. Suddenly I crossed a veil of darkness so vast that in your wildest imagination you could never imagine what it's like to cross the veil. Now I'm not going to be able to tell you today what it's like to cross the veil because I don't have any words. Even if I had the words you wouldn't have the capacity to perceive. But don't lose any sleep worrying over it because you're going to know you're going that way one day. The Bible refers to the veil as the valley of the shadow of death. Some Christians refer to it as crossing Jordan. You see, the veil is not in this world. Neither is it in the world to come. It's only the bridge, the way, the door, or the valley between the two. When we leave this life and go to the life to come, we all, will pass through the valley of the shadow of death. Since the veil is in neither world, there's no light in the veil at all. It's total and complete darkness. I suppose it's because I had never experienced total and complete darkness before. I suppose that's what momentarily made me feel abandoned, forsaken, all alone. When suddenly out of that vast darkness an object came, like a ticker tape suspended in space, just turning round and around before my eyes. It was a verse of scripture right out of this Bible. As it began to turn, I began to read it. Hebrew chapter 9, verse 27. It is appointed unto all men once to die. After this, the judgment. This was God's way of supernaturally revealing to me that I had met my appointed time to die. I didn't want to die. I didn't leave home to die. I wasn't sick when I left home that morning. I left home to win an election. I was involved in a political campaign. I thought I had a chance to win that campaign. Certainly I wasn't expecting to die. I didn't want to die. Instantly, the Holy Spirit began to intercede on my behalf. I didn't even recognize him. I'd never been taught about the supernatural prior to this. Although I grew up in a, in a traditional fundamentalist Christian family, had been taught the principles of love, mercy, grace, and salvation, had never been taught about the supernatural, had never been taught about the devil, had never been taught about demons. Oh, I knew what the Bible said about the devil. I knew what it said about demons, but... I never considered it to be very important because uh, it wasn't part of my traditional upbringing or traditional training. And certainly uh, the um, supernatural had never been part of my training. Uh, I had never even been taught about the extracurricular activities of the Holy Spirit. But one thing I had been taught, and that was to respect the authenticity and integrity of God's Word. You see, I believed God's word. That was the one thing I had going for me. I believed God's word. The next thing he did was flood my mind with the knowledge of the eight separate individuals listed in this Bible that God had raised from the dead. There's eight of them there. Suddenly I caught it, not wanting to die, 
Like Hezekiah, I cried out to God in a short and pointed prayer. I asked him to extend my life. Immediately upon conclusion of that prayer, I had my first ever supernatural encounter. Although I didn't immediately see anything, out of that vast darkness, a voice spoke to me. A supernatural, audible voice. But what a voice. No human ear had ever heard the sound. Oh, how beautiful, how sweet, how totally captivating. If I had all the words in all the languages of all the world, I could never, ever describe this voice. How sweet, how totally captivating. You might even say hypnotic. The very tone of the voice itself testified the speaker was God. As the voice said to me, Stop. Don't breathe. No more pain. Peace. Rest. Security. Just don't breathe. Well, for over 30 years I had professed to serve God. You can imagine what I'm going to do. My very best to obey in one final attempt to obey. I tried to muster every ounce of strength I had when all of a sudden as though I screamed as loud as I could and my spirit as a realization hit me. No! What am I doing? I just asked God to extend my life. I don't breathe. I'm going to die. You're not God. With that exclamation, Satan fled from me. There beyond the veil of tears, in the valley of death, at the door, he had lied to me. He told me he was God. He couldn't kill me. He had to get me to kill myself by lowering my will to live. You better know the spirit that speaks to you. Your life could depend on it. You think not? <clears throat> I've got news for you. You can rub all the rabbit feet you want to rub, but you're going to cross that veil. Suppose, just suppose, you have to fight your final battle the other side of that veil. Or in the veil, as I had to fight mine. How will you know the counterfeit? Or would you be like me? Never heard a sermon on the devil before in my entire life. No one had ever told me how to recognize him. No one ever told me I'm going to have to meet him. I'm going to have to fight him every day. I'm going to have to meet him every day. I'm going to have to resist him. I'm going to have to overcome him. Or he's going to overcome me. It's a daily battle. When I resisted the devil and he fled from me, the angels were all around me. They had been there all the time. They had never made their presence known until I resisted the devil. At that moment, they took my spirit out of my body, out of darkness into light. I had crossed the veil. I was on the other side. That old ambulance was going down the road. It had Howard Pittman's body, but it didn't have Howard Pittman. The angels of glory had Howard Pittman on the other side. Do we have a precedent for such a thing in God's word? We do indeed. Fourth chapter of Revelation. Where John's body was left on the Isle of Patmos, his spirit was carried into the spirit world. He was given a panoramic view of church history, brought back, put in his body, told to write about it, and he wrote the book of Revelation. The only book in the Bible that was given to a human being in an out-of-body experience. <clears throat> the first thing I was allowed to look upon as, a spirit, as the angels carried my spirit into the spirit world, the very first thing I was allowed to look upon was a panoramic view of a living verse of Scripture being acted out before my eyes, that verse of Scripture, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. When you read it in your Bible, it will say, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, 
but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world in high, wicked, spiritual places. If you will, please. A description of a satanic, demonic government where the warfare plans are literally being drawn up against the saints of God. If you're a Christian, you're called a war. Did you know that? If you're not a Christian, you're a prisoner of war. Did you know that? No neutrals in this life. Doesn't matter what you believe, what you think. It <clears throat> doesn't change the fact of what Jesus said. He said, you gather with me or you scatter against me. If you're not gathering with him, you're scattering against him. Now, you make the choices. You determine where you're going to gather with him or scatter against him. As I watched this ruling council work, I discovered that satanic and demonic activity in the lives of human beings is not accidental or haphazard. It's done by design. You've been searched. Your weakness is cataloged. Your tempter assigned expertly. If you don't know about spiritual war, you better learn in a hurry. For the last great battle the church has got to fight is just over the horizon. The question I ask to you, O church, as soldiers of the cross, are you ready? Are you ready? Your adversary is ready. If you're not trained, God help us. God help us. Time will not permit me to go into spiritual warfare. I did want to touch it, touch on it even in this lesson. So many people out there grew up like me, traditional Christians, completely void of any teaching concerning spiritual warfare. If you was in the same boat that I was in, take a word of advice. Study. Show yourself approved. Ready for this next, next great battle that's about to come. While all this was going on, the angels were actually escorting me into the second heaven. And our Bible does in fact refer to three heavens. You'd be surprised how many Christians don't know this. Don't even understand that the Christian Bible refers to three heavens. There's no reference to a seventh heaven in the Christian Bible. A lot of uh, people talk about a seventh heaven as a place of euphoric existence. But that of course did not come from the Christian Bible. Some reference to that is found in Jewish writings, in Jewish literature. It's also reference to it found in the Muslim Bible. But there's no reference in the Christian Bible. The Christian Bible refers to three heavens. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2 and 3 identifies the third heaven as God's throne room. The spiritual realm where the angels had me as I was allowed to look upon this demonic and satanic government is the second heaven where the warfare plans are literally being drawn up against the saints of God. It was here I was thinking uh, that this was all routine. I, 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 at the time it was happening, I thought every human being who met their appointed time to die would have to experience something similar to what I was experiencing. I knew all the time that the angels had me there that... Um, my physical body was in a hospital, it was on a bed, and it had a machine that was actually pumping the blood through the veins. It had another machine that was pumping the air into the lungs. I was aware of this body being there. I, I was also aware that this body was still alive. But I knew that it wouldn't, if I stayed away, if this spirit stayed away too long, this body would never get off that bed. The only way it was ever going to get up, I had to go back into it. And I knew that I was out of reach of any man. Didn't matter how skilled his hands, nor how technical equipment, I had crossed the veil. There wasn't any way man was going to reach on the other side of the veil to pull me back. So I knew if my spirit came back now, it would be as the direct result of God himself intervening. So I made my anxiety known to the angels, who assured me nothing would happen to that body until God said so. Isn't it marvelous to know who has the final say. Our God truly has the final say. I'd always heard that song 
but it never really impressed me as much until I had this experience. I may not know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. Oh, I know. God has the final say. I was anxious that this body not die, the physical body. I didn't want to lose that physical life. The angels assured me that I would have the opportunity of pleading for this, an extension of this physical life before the living God. But first they said they wanted me to see another place in the spirit realm. This place they took me to, the beauty of it is staggering, defies any attempt to describe or any stretch of man's imagination to comprehend. Absolutely impossible. So the words I'm going to use won't describe what I saw. It will simply allow you to comprehend what I'm trying to talk about. Let's say this place looked just like a tunnel that ran through the sky. Far greater than a tunnel, but that's the closest we're going to come to it. Now the angels never let me get in the tunnel. They brought me to a portion of the wall that was invisible. They let me look through this invisible wall into the center of this tunnel. There's a highway lined on either side with the most beautiful flowers. Flower garden that would uh, defy any attempt to describe because the colors of those flowers, not just the flowers, but the colors of those flowers were alive, were different, vibrant. No way to describe, but they were so far, far more beautiful than any flowers we'd ever looked upon in this earth. It has not entered the mind of man, neither has the eye seen, nor even comprehended the beauty. At the farthest end of this tunnel was a brilliant light, so brilliant there was no shadows anywhere in the tunnel, yet soft enough to look at. Walking on that highway at first glance was what appeared to be normal, ordinary human beings. But as I looked at them closely, I realized they were not ordinary. They were super extraordinary. I say to the angels escorting me, who are they? While they replied, those are God's children going home. Glory to God, I'd always known the Bible had talked about a heavenly highway. But I had never perceived that as being a literal place. I always thought that was figuratively speaking. But I'm here to testify to you today there is a heavenly highway where only the redeemed can walk. No foul or evil spirit permitted therein. And if you want to read about it in your Bible, Isaiah referred to it, chapter 35, verse 8 through 10. As I watched the saints walk that highway, three of the greatest truths of this Bible overwhelmed me. They are so staggering, I promise you, in your finite condition, you can't comprehend these truths. The only way that you can know they're true, because God said they were. As I watched those saints, the first thing that dawned on me was, hey, they don't have any age. They're not old. They're not young. They're not middle-aged. They don't have any age. Comprehend that. You can't do it, can you? You never looked at anything that wasn't touched by time. Even brand new, it's touched by time. But you see, eternity is void of time. It is without beginning or end. Hence, no time. Look it up in your dictionary. No time. To have age, you have to have time. If you have no time, you will have no age. And when you're in a land where there's no time and no age, what does the Bible call it? A land where you never grow old. You don't grow old because there's no time there at all. Hard to comprehend, you say? You think that's hard. Hold on to your seat. When I tell this next one, well, I've had some folks say, Whew, you sound like a man that fell out of a tree and landed on your head. What in the world was those doctors shooting you with that day? Well, they hadn't shot me with anything. 
But I said at the beginning, I come as a teller, not as a convincer. They say, well, I don't care if that was chisel in stone written in red, I would believe it. Well, I can't testify it's chisel in stone, <laughs> but it's written in red. Still, a lot of folks won't believe it because it goes against tradition. You know that fellow? Tradition? <laughs> you ever let him get his feet under your table, you'll discover how hard he is to get out of your kitchen. The next thing that dawned on me was, wow, they're neither male nor female. Oh. Some of you fellows have a hard time with this one, don't you? Jesus testified in Luke, well, first, three times in this Bible, written in red, Jesus Christ, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, testified. The first place he testified was in Matthew chapter 22, verse 15 through 33. The second place he testified was in Mark chapter 12, verse 13 through 27. The third place he testified to this truth was in Luke chapter 20, verse 27 through 37, written in red, you won't be married in heaven. Only one marriage to occur in heaven when the Lamb takes the bride. Now, why won't you be married in heaven? This Bible tells. But I have to be honest with you, I have a problem proving with the Bible. You know what that problem is? Bible skeptics. You know what a Bible skeptic is? He's a Bible expert. He can tell you all about the Bible. If you don't believe it, ask him. But you say, well, the Bible says, oh, he said, you don't believe that. You can't believe it. Don't mean that. means something else. So you waste your breath trying to convince the Bible skeptic of anything with the Bible. Don't. You waste your breath. I have given this testimony around the world in the past 12 years, almost somewhere every day. Never made a meeting. I didn't find at least one Bible skeptic in probably won't have to go too far out of this room to find him, huh? What you think? But I'll tell you what, I've never found a dictionary skeptic. I've never seen anybody challenge a single word to dictionary of you. Even all those old Bible skeptics seem to accept every word in the dictionary just like it's gospel, huh? Suppose they got the gospels mixed up, don't you? <laughs> well, do you suppose they would believe it if they could read it in the dictionary? Well, you can. It's been in the dictionary all the time. If you don't believe it, take down your dictionary right now. Look up the definition of that word spirit. In the definition of the word spirit, just as it's given in the back of most Bibles, you will see that even Webster's New Collegiate International Dictionary, desk volume, actually gives an explanation of why there won't be any marriage in heaven. For you discover that all spirits are sexless. That sex was given to the mortal body for the purpose of reproduction. Immortal spirits do not reproduce, hence they are sexless. The third and final truth that I learned watching those saints walk the tunnel suddenly it dawned upon me as I looked at them. I could not tell what they had been in physical life. I couldn't tell if they had been white, black, red, or yellow. Just like it says in Galatians chapter 3 verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Immortal spirits are raceless. If you will accept God's word, most people don't, goes against tradition, but if you will accept God's word, this Bible teaches that in eternity, as an immortal spirit, you will be ageless, sexless, and raceless but you will be the same unique individual there that you are here. You will know and be known just as you know and are known. You just won't look like there what you look like here. And after all, to a lot of us, that's good news, isn't it? Did you know this Bible says that you're going to change appearances three times in the course of your existence? You didn't know that? That's been in this book all these many hundreds of years. How long has it been since you read this book? Look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 40. There it tells you there's a difference in the appearance of a celestial body and the appearance of a terrestrial body. But look at verse 44. 
Verse 44 is even much more graphic. It tells you you have a physical body as well as a spiritual body. As a spirit, you will have a body. You won't be out of like a puff of wind or a gob of fog, all out of shape, all out of form. You're going to have a body. See, the psychics today teach that the spirit is void of form, that it doesn't have a form or a body. That shows what God they're working for. This Bible, 1 Corinthians 15, 44, tells us that the spirit does have a form. It does have a body. I was allowed to look at that spiritual body. It mimics a human body. It has a head, two, a torso, two arms, two legs, just like a human body. It just does not reflect age, sex, or race. That automatically alters your appearance. It doesn't alter you. You're the same you in that body that you are in this one. In fact, you've never seen you. You are an immortal spirit residing in a mortal body. And when you looked in the mirror this morning, you looked at a body, the reflection of a mortal body. And that reflection you saw this morning don't look like what it did 14 months ago, does it? Because time, like a sledgehammer, is working on this body. Just to keep it going down here, most of the time we need doctor's office and beauty parlors, don't we? But you won't need them over there because you're not subject to time. Your third and final appearance will be glorified. Now you want to see Jesus in all three of those forms? You read John chapter 20 through 22. You'll see him crucified in the flesh. You'll see him raised in the spirit. You'll see him walk along the seashore glorified. He was the same Jesus all the way through. He had changed appearances from the flesh to the spirit to the glorified. But he was the same Jesus all the way through. You'll be the same. Your appearance will change. In the spirit realm, you won't recognize by appearance. You will recognize by spirit. You will know and be known instantly, just as you know and are known. Well, I don't suppose you have to believe that to go to heaven. I just didn't want you surprised when you got there. I want you to know it's in God's Word, and it has been ever since we've had this Bible. I arrived outside of the gates of the third heaven, ready to go and plead my case. The angels stopped me. They said, we brought you to that tunnel to perceive four truths. You saw only three. Go back and look again. They brought me back and let me look until... Fifty saints had been permitted to enter the gates of heaven one at a time. They returned, and I still could not perceive the fourth and final truth. So they told me what I was looking at and was not aware of. They wanted me to be aware of the number of the saints in the tunnel, the insignificant number. Matthew 7, 14. For straight is the gate, narrow the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And then they told me what I was looking at represented one 15-minute segment of time where God had harvested out of the planet Earth. That 15-minute span of time, August 3, 1979, from 4.45 till 5 o'clock, approximating the distance in time from where the paramedic judged me to be dead in that ambulance until my body arrived at the hospital. In that approximate 15-minute span of time, these 50 saints had died the physical death in Christ, and their physical body was right where they died, but their spirit had gone home. Know that you are an immortal spirit. When this old flesh dies, the spirit's going to leave this body. No spirit can, in can inhabit a dead body. Physical death expels all spirits. Your spirit will be released from that body the moment that body dies. That spirit won't go to sleep in the grave with the body. It's going home. The angels let me look. Now you won't go home by the way of the grave. You won't even make it to the cemetery. Don't you fear the grave. You won't know the grave. Saved all all. There's a place for you on the other side of that veil. Although if you're lost, the grave would be a welcome respite. But you won't know the grave. That spirit will go home. Then the host of heaven said to me, Why? You, why? 
we permitted you to look at this 15 minutes because it represented the spiritual condition of the planet Earth. They said to me, along with those 50 saints who died in that 15 minute span of time, 1,950 other humans had also died with them, but they were not there. They had taken the other door out of the back side of the veil. 2,000 humans had died in one 15 minute span of time on the planet Earth and 50 of them made it to heaven. 97.5 never made it. Only two and one half percent made it. Matthew 7, 13, For broad is the gate, and wide is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. In one 15-minute span of time on the planet Earth, a specified, this was not an average time, it was a specified or specific time frame. Those 50 saints that died in that specified time represented God's whole harvest on the planet Earth. Had August 3rd, 1979 been the day the trumpet would have blown so loud it would awaken the dead, Jesus would have found two and one half percent of the planet Earth ready to go home. 97.5 would not have made it. Think about it a moment. If it had been August 3rd, 1979, would you have been in that number? If not, thank God for his mercy. Long suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. But there is a time in already appointed beyond which there will be no extension. If you don't know what your priorities ought to be, ask me. I know. I leave that between you and God. I arrived outside of the gates of heaven ready to go in and plead my case. I'd been there the second time. The angels stopped me the second time. They said, now, if you go in those gates, you can't come out. You'll have to stay till he brings you back. But I said, if I can't come out, that means my physical life's over. My body won't get up off that bed. And I didn't get a chance to plead for my physical life. The angel said, then you stand here. Talk to him and he will hear you. Boldly, I came to the gates. As I looked up, I could not even see the top. I began to plead to a God I could not see. No sound in all of heaven save the sound of my plea. When I finished, then God spoke to me in an audible voice. I'm going to quote for you verbatim part of what God said as he spoke to me that day. The rest I'll paraphrase. I want you to know when I quote the living God that where I'm quoting him verbatim, it will certainly be in quotation marks, otherwise the conversation will be paraphrased. And I do this because of the many things I found out that day. One, I shall never forget how our God is extremely displeased with many modern Christians who continue to insist upon misquoting him. Now God does not mind being quoted, but he hates to be misquoted. He hates it so much that he said in Deuteronomy chapter 20, uh, chapter 18, verse 20, But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. Unquote. Many people say, well, see right there. That, that proves he didn't mean it because, look, every Sunday you see television preachers lie in God's name and they don't die. Well, you might say that, but... See, I happen to know the Bible said in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 11 that God does not always speedily execute his sentences, but execute them he will. Now, if you belong to him, you're going to be a witness against me the day I give account of these words. I'm going to give an account of them, not you. And that's why I choose carefully my words. To the best of my ability, I'm going to quote verbatim, part of what the living God spoke to me in an audible voice. The rest I'll paraphrase. Let me tell you about the voice he spoke to me in first. It wasn't sweet. It wasn't like the voice the devil used. It wasn't lovely. It wasn't hypnotic. It wasn't even desirable. In fact, the closest description I can find of that voice that he spoke to me is found in John chapter 12, verse 28 and 29, where the voice of God is described as a sound of thunder. 
He spoke to me in a thunderous voice. As his voice came down over those gates before his words reached me, the tone of his wrath had knocked me on my face, had zapped every ounce of strength in my being as my God proceeded to tell me who I was. Not who I thought I was. See, I discovered those two people were not even kin. Quote, verbatim, the first part of our conversation. Quote, your faith is dead. Your works are in vain. The life that you lived and offered to me as a life of Christian service is an abomination that I rejected in the Pharisee. What made you think I would take that kind of offering from a Laodicean type Christian? In fact, untold millions are living the same kind of life that you live and they stand in danger of my everlasting wrath. Unquote the living God. No, Lord, wait a minute. That's not me that you're talking about. Don't you know who I am? I'm a preacher. I'm a teacher. My name's Howard Pittman. That's not me. He was calling me a Laodicean type Christian. You know what a Laodicean type Christian is? He's described in your Bible, Revelation chapter uh, 3, verse 14 through 22, but he's a hypocrite that plays church. He goes to church and with his lips he's saying, Oh, how I love Jesus. But that lying rascal can't wait to get out of church to show the world who he really loves by serving the devil all week long. Next meeting day is right back in church saying, Oh, how I love Jesus. And there's all this old world of compadres out in the world peeping through the window and said, Boy, if that's a Christian, I'm glad I'm not one. That's why God hates him. Because he did what the devil could not do. By playing church, he turned the world off to Jesus Christ. He enlarged the borders of hell. You better believe there's going to be wailing and gnashing of teeth if you can't be a light. For the sake of your soul, dare not be a stumbling block. If you're going to play, don't you go to church to play. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Oh my God, Lord, that's not me, that's not me. Heaven was made of brass. He wouldn't answer me. Suddenly a witness spoke. In one word, that witness convicted me. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Have you heard that? Every sinner will say amen. Have you heard that? Do you know why? Because of the witness that got me. We'll get them. We'll get you too. You know that witness? Jesus identified him for you. Right here in his word. Matthew. Chapter 12. Verse 37. I want to read it for you. Matthew 12. Verse 37. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. That witness, this old tongue, James said it set on fire by fires of hell. Cut this flesh with a knife, it'll heal. Cut this heart with that tongue, it may never heal. Men have tamed the most ferocious beast that ever walked the face of the earth, but this tongue they can't tame. Go ahead and say those words. All of them, doesn't matter. You won't unsay them. Matthew 12, 36. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. You don't speak words. You birth them. They are spiritual. You give them life and they wait for you. Matthew 12, 36 and 37. There they were. Every promise that every made, all of them broken. In 30 years of service, I never had one single promise intact. Not one. Thirty years of service. Every one of them I had managed to break somehow. Every one of them. Even the most sacred vows I had made to my own family. None of them intact. There they were. Every promise I'd ever made. Every word I'd ever spoken. It is me. That's me. That's really me. But Lord, Lord, don't you understand? I stood on the sidewalk and preached 
preach to the passerby. I went up to the jail and preached to the prisoners, over to the hospital, prayed for the sick, I opened my home, I shared with others. I was there when you preached on the sidewalk. I was there when you knelt by the hospital bed. I was there when you opened your home and shared with others. I saw your works, all of them. They were good. They were my works, the works that I've ordained for my church, the works that my people offer me every day. But in your case, they are in vain. You didn't do them for me. You did them for a false god. And I said in my word, Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, I am a jealous god. I will have no other gods before me. But Lord, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I didn't do them for a false god. I did them for you. I called you Lord every day. Yes, you called me Lord. But you never made me Lord. Or do you know to call him Lord only gives him a title? When you make him Lord, he must become ruler of life. But Lord, I did all this in your name. You did it in my name, but not for me. You did it for a false god. I couldn't see that god and then he named him. Instantly I recognized him. Satan's number one selling false god. The one that you will have more to fear than all the others. When hell is emptied, 95% of the people there will be there as a result of serving that same false god. S-E-L-F lovely old self because self-ruled in my life Jesus Christ had no place they took me away let me regain my composure brought me back and let me plead till the scales fell off my eye suddenly I saw what it was they wanted me to see I was pleading for the wrong life a life that came from dirt it was going back to dirt no matter what but housed within that life was an immortal life a life that would never end a life that was precious to him. The Lord that made all of this had before him in my person the least, smallest, insignificant creature in his entire kingdom and he hurt for me. He hurt for me. Nothing mattered now. Not my life. Not my soul. The only thing mattered now I not hurt my father again when this life mattered not to me he gave it back sent me back to do what I've done touch on five quick points and we're going to close I have a five point message to the church I had to share with you my testimony so that you would understand my authority to deliver this tough message to the church let me tell you about my commission he gave me a limited commission he placed two restrictions on me. Restriction number one was that I could not ask anyone to hear this, but I must go tell whoever I'm asked. Restriction number two was that I couldn't ask for help. Why would he do this? Why would he place these kind of restrictions on anyone? Had to do with the restricted commission that he was going to give me. You know what commission he gave the church. He sent the church in the world to preach the gospel. The church does not have to wait for an invitation. It can ask anybody to help them because they've been sent to the entire world. He wasn't going to bring me back to preach the gospel to the world. In order to do that, he would have to take the commission away from the church and give it to me. He wasn't about to do that. He had already given it to the church. He was going to give me a limited commission. He sent me back in the world, but not to preach the gospel to the world. He sent me to the church with a message of warning. He wanted them to hear this warning one more time. Since I would not always know where his church was, and he would, I would not have the liberty of choosing my audience. He would choose them for me. All I had to do was accept every invitation that came, put it on my schedule. If it didn't come from him, he'd close the door before I got there. If it came from him, no man would close the door. He gave me nine months to prepare for this mission from August 3rd, 79 to May 7th, 1980. On the seventh day of May, he said, now go. Within 36 months, this testimony had reached every continent on earth. Basically, it's been told on most every major Christian radio and television network in North America and most of the world. At least one fellowship of almost every Christian denomination in North America and most of the world. We've never asked anybody to hear it, yet he's had us so busy telling it that 1989, 1991, my wife and I spent less than 90 days at home. We saw our children, our grandchildren, less than 90 days. Living on the road, airport apron, shopping center mall, church parking lot, good people's driveway, hotels, motels, RV campgrounds, wherever we could find a place. Sleep, meet, take a bath, change clothes, go to the next door with a message so hard the world can't hear it, so hard Christians don't want to hear it. 
Nowhere in this book did it say it would be easy. What it said was it would be possible. So you can study this Bible all you want to, and you won't find a single place where it says take up your roses and follow me. What it says is take up your cross and follow me. Not many modern Christians are looking for a cross. Is the servant any greater than the master? The five points we're going to close. Point number one, this is the Laodicean church age in which we live today. Where the overwhelming majority of so-called Christians, I'm sorry to report to you today, are just that, so-called. They're mouth professors and not heart possessors. And unless they wake up with this shaking, he's going to regurgitate them. His promise to do that, your Bible, Revelation chapter 3, verse 16. Point number two, your adversary, the devil, is a personal and powerful adversary whose ability the church has grossly, and I do mean grossly, underestimated. I'm going to give you one piece of evidence to consider. If that don't touch you, nothing will. That piece of evidence, look at the average modern church fellowship. What does the world see? A wet noodle, reflecting no power, no compassion, most cases no love. The church as a whole, what does the world see? A divided body, cut in over a hundred pieces, with most of the members in the, within the individual's fellowship spending the majority of their time vilifying another piece, leaving the devil free to roam within the church. As a born-again believer, you're to give no place in your life to the devil. You're to give him no fear, no love. Meet him on the field of battle and defeat him. Point number three. If you're ever going to experience any of God's miraculous power in your life, you're going to have to live that life, not just talk it. When the folks down where you work, shop, socialize, live, eat, sleep, when those people who know your private life, after seeing your private life, can believe the words of your mouth, when you testify for Jesus Christ, then you can call upon his name, expect to hear from it. Point number four. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 36, just before his second return to the planet Earth, or 37 rather, conditions on earth would once again mimic the conditions just prior to Noah's day. The conditions on earth at that time, mankind had but two priorities, wealth and pleasure, wealth and pleasure. Everything else was secondary. Right where we are today, keep your eye upon the eastern sky. Your redemption draws nigh. It's close. Oh, so very close. Point number five. This is the one that's we're all about. Were it not for point number five, I wouldn't be here. Because of point number five, he sent me back. He's recruiting an army, and I'm one of his recruiting sergeants. He's going to shake this world one more time. He said in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27, I will have me a glorious church without spot, wrinkle or blemish. Look about your little church. What do you see? A spotted church. No matter how much fanaticism, you see a spotted church. I'm here to tell you, he's not going to marry this bride until he cleans her up. She's got a putrefied garment on. He's going to have him a spotless bride. Ephesians 5, 27. How is he going to do that? Just like John, uh, John is quoted by Matthew chapter 3, 11 and 12 saying, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. It is he who will baptize you with Holy Ghost and fire. Little church, you've had the water. Little church, you've had the Holy Ghost. Get ready, little church. Yonder comes the fire. The third and final baptism. Just a teeny problem with a few of us in this church. Little bitty problem. <laughs> it's going to take a blowtorch. He's going to have to scorch us up one side and down the other to make us turn loose this world. But if you think God can shake this world with carnal-minded Christians, I invite you to read the book one more time. Read the book one more time. I didn't mean to hurt anyone, to belittle anyone, to insult anyone. This is a hard message. The kind of message that you can hear from no man. You can only hear this message from God's announcer. And no man announces for God. He didn't send me back to announce this message to you. He sent me back to confirm it. To those who have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, I'm here to confirm it. 
See, the Holy Spirit's God's announcer. Dearly beloved, if you're out there today and you've never made a public commitment to Jesus Christ, or if you've made a public commitment to Him and you've been in a backslidden condition, now you're worried about your salvation, or perhaps you're just under an extra heavy ordinary attack of doubt, for whatever it is you're doubting your salvation, the Lord has given you an opportunity this day to make that commitment and set it right. If you're looking at your television screen right now, or you're listening to this on audio cassette, just lay your hand on the radio or the television, or grab hands with someone else if you're in the audience, and repeat after me this little prayer, and just Say it with all of your being to your Heavenly Father. Father, we thank you for your word in which you said to us, if we would believe in our heart, confess with our mouth, and repent with our life, you would save our soul. This day, this night, this morning, this time, I believe in my heart. I confess with my mouth. I trust you with my mind, so that I might repent with my life. Therefore, I stand on your word. According to that word, that same word, I now receive the salvation. I accept your forgiveness. I thank you for saving my soul. Now, Father, I know there are some of us here who had tried to play a game with you by trying to hide from you part of our private life which we only called you Lord but did not make you Lord. For this act, we publicly repent. We invite you in our life to be the Lord of all our life, every day of our life. Give us wisdom to detect the enemy and grace to defeat him. Because you said it in your word, we believe it in our heart. Because of this, this day, this day, we now receive it in our heart. In your precious name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you, each and every one. Thank you so very, very much for your kind attention today. Until we meet, here or there, God be with you.